Welcome to the video summary series for Pedisco's financial accounting textbook. In addition to chapter summary videos such as this one, financial accounting also offers podcasts, virtual tutor e-learning, homework activities with anti-cheat and auto-grade functionality, and detailed instructor resources. Find out more at pedisco.com forward slash finac. For now, over to the author. Hi again, I'm Rachel White and welcome to the next summary in the Pedisco Accounting series. In this one, we're going to look at how we allocate costs to inventory, starting with inventory fundamentals, inventory costing methods under the perpetual inventory system, and valuing inventory at other than cost. Let's start with some inventory fundamentals. When we're looking to assign the costs to inventory, first, we need to know what is included in inventory. For a retailer and a wholesaler, inventory includes merchandise held for sale, while for a manufacturer, inventory may also include raw materials or work currently in the process of being manufactured for eventual sale to customers. For the purpose of this summary, we're going to focus on inventory as merchandise held for sale. At the reporting date, we need to know how much inventory the business is to report on their balance sheet. But there are two cases where it is not completely clear who should report the goods as part of their inventory. Goods in transit and consignment goods. When goods are in transit at the reporting date, it is the party that holds the title to the goods at the reporting date who owns the goods and reports them as part of their inventory. The title is determined by the shipping terms. Under FOB Shipping Point, the buyer owns the goods and reports them as part of their inventory, while under FOB Destination, it is the seller who owns and reports the inventory in their balance sheet. The second case where it may not be clear as to who reports the goods as part of their inventory is for goods on consignment, where the owner, called the consigner, ships the goods to the consignee to sell the goods on their behalf. It is the consigner who still has ownership of the goods and reports them as part of their inventory, even though the consignee may have physical custody of the goods. Now that we've discussed some inventory fundamentals, let's move on to the focus of the chapter, using the inventory costing methods under the perpetual inventory system to determine the cost of goods sold and ending inventory. Consider the situation where a business buys liquid chocolate, repackages it and sells it to customers. During the accounting period, the business purchases more liquid chocolate, this time at a higher price than the chocolate currently contained in their storage container. Both the lower and the higher priced chocolate are mixed together in the same storage container and sold to customers. At the end of the accounting period, the dilemma is, of the chocolate sold and the chocolate remaining in the storage container, how much was at the lowest price and how much was at the highest price? This is the dilemma we seek to solve by applying the inventory costing methods. There are four inventory costing methods that can be used to assign the cost of goods available for sale throughout the period to cost of goods sold and ending inventory. The specific identification method assigns the actual purchase cost of the item to each item of inventory held by the business and uses this actual cost to calculate cost of goods sold and ending inventory. While this method traces actual costs through inventory, the remaining three methods all make an assumption about the flow of costs through inventory to cost of goods sold so are known as inventory cost flow assumptions. The first in, first out, or FIFO method, assumes that the first units of inventory purchased are the first units to be sold. Therefore, at each sale, the cost of the oldest purchases are assigned to cost of goods sold, leaving the cost of the most recent purchases in ending inventory. The last in, first out, or LIFO method, assumes that the last units of inventory purchased are the first units to be sold. Therefore, at each sale, the cost of the most recent purchases are assigned to cost of goods sold, leaving the cost of the oldest purchases in ending inventory. The average cost method assigns an average cost of the inventory available for sale to both cost of goods sold and ending inventory. Under the perpetual system, the average cost method is known as the moving average cost method. This is because a new average cost is calculated after each purchase, so the average cost moves over time. Let's now look at a simple example of how to apply the LIFO assumption under the perpetual inventory system. We can see from the inventory card that we commence the accounting period with 50 units at a cost of $1 each. Two purchases were made during the period, 60 units for $2 each were purchased on the 7th and 70 units for $3 each were purchased on the 17th. 
We can see the inventory balance after these two purchases records a separate line for each unique unit cost of inventory. On the 27th, 90 units of the inventory were sold. Under LIFO, we assume that these items sold were the ones from the most recent purchase, which was the 70 units at $3 each. So we record 70 units at $3 each in the cost of goods sold columns. We assume the remaining 20 units sold were from the next most recent purchase at $2 per unit and record this on a separate line in the cost of goods sold columns. The inventory balance is recorded on a line by line basis for each unique unit cost by taking the previous inventory balance and subtracting the number of goods sold at that unit price. None of the units sold were assumed to have cost $1, so the 50 units at $1 is transferred to the first line in the balance columns. Of the 60 units at $2 each, we assume that we sold 20, leaving 40 units at $2 each to be recorded in the balance columns. Since we assume that all 70 units at $3 each were sold, no units that cost $3 each are recorded in the balance column. The cost of goods sold for the period can be calculated by adding together the values in the total cost column under the cost of goods sold heading. Here, the cost of goods sold is $250. The balance of ending inventory is calculated by adding together the total cost under the inventory balance column, but just for the last entry in the inventory card. In this case, ending inventory is equal to $130. We've just gone through a simple example of how to calculate the cost of goods sold and ending inventory using the LIFO cost flow assumption. But there are other inventory costing methods that can be used to calculate these values. The best way to learn them is to practice them, which is where your Podisco Virtual Tutor questions can help. You'll find many questions for you to practice such as this one, where under the Perpetual Inventory system, you are required to calculate the value of ending inventory using the first in, first out method. We can enter the value of ending inventory, submit that, and now we get personalised feedback for our answers and an explanation for the question. The inventory costing methods we have just discussed are based on recording inventory at cost. Let's now look at valuing inventory at other than cost. There may be times when cost is not the most appropriate way to value inventory. This may occur when the purchase price of the goods decreases or when the goods are unable to be sold at normal prices, perhaps because they are damaged or have become obsolete. When this occurs, accounting principles require the application of the lower of cost or market rule. The lower or cost or market rule requires that inventories are to be reported at their current market value when the market value is lower than the cost recorded for the item. Rather than focusing on how to identify the market value of the item, let's focus on how to use the market value of an item when applying the lower of cost or market rule. When calculating the value to be reported in ending inventory, we can apply the lower of cost or market rule to individual items of inventory, categories of inventory or the entire balance of inventory. Each of these methods results in a different amount to be recognised in ending inventory. I'm not going to go into the detail of how to calculate the law of cost or market under each of the three approaches. Instead, I encourage you to study the chapter in your Podisco textbook, where there is a detailed example of calculating and then journalising the adjusting entry required to apply the law of cost or market rule. So that's chapter six, inventories. The key topics were inventory fundamentals, inventory costing methods under the perpetual inventory system, and valuing inventory at other than cost.